The ANA eLearning Academy is brought to you by CDN Graysheet, a trusted source of rare coin and currency valuations since 1963. Hello, and thank you for joining us at the ANA's eLearning Academy. I'm Andy Dickus here at uh, ANA headquarters in Colorado Springs, and I'd like to welcome you to today's presentation, The Development of Art Societies in America. I'd also like to thank the Gray Sheet for their continued sponsorship of our e-learning program. Today's presenters are two of the most foremost experts on, on American metals. David Alexander and David Menchel are authors, of uh, authors, longtime ANA summer seminar instructors, and they've uh, both received many awards from the ANA and other uh, organizations. So without further ado, gentlemen, I pass it over to you. Very good. All right, so uh, what we're going to do is discuss basically 20th century art metal societies in America. And in order to do that, we just wanna begin with a little bit of introductory material uh, because uh, the art metal societies wouldn't exist. Uh, whoops, let me just make sure we have the screen sharing here. Uh, it looks like we got a little technical issue here because it's not, it's, uh, the screen isn't moving on my computer. Uh, make sure. David, it's looking good from my vantage point. I don't know about everybody else out there, but you're... Right, I can, uh, uh, well, I don't see the uh, screen advancing. Oh, wait a second, one second. Here we go. All right, now I figured yeah. out where, where I have to press to do it, sorry. Okay, so basically, in order to talk about uh, uh, the art metal societies, we have to talk a little bit about art metals. And uh, basically, this was something of development uh, starting in uh, late 19th century France, and it had to do with a uh, change in the uh, use of the metal from a, a historical commemorative or award function to something that became a means of artistic expression. And it had went along with other movements in the arts and music and literature and painting and what have you, and uh, allowed for greater uh, expression of artistic freedom and emotions and very, you know, depictions on metals that really uh, were novel at that time. And there were a number of French artists who were responsible for this. Probably one of the earliest was uh, David D'Angiers with uh, his uh, cast medals, which was also something which was a bit of a renovation at the time, and a number of other French artists, many of whom were instructors at the academies uh, in France at the time. Uh, and a lot of this also has to do with technical innovations in addition to artistic innovations. Uh, one major contribution was the use of the reduction lace. And there were a series of machines that were developed as we see here that changed the nature of uh, engraving. And uh, you basically uh, allowed people who were not engravers primarily, but sculptors and artists to now design metals because you could take and produce a positive image, a plaster, uh, something that they would be more comfortable, more familiar with. And you can then take that pattern and then reduce it down to a metal, uh, to a die, I should say, and then strike a metal. And uh, there's an example here of, of several of these types of metals. There was a renewed interest in the cast metal. And just to the right, we see uh, David Dangier's large uh, portrait of uh, Goethe. And he did uh, several hundred of these, uh, but he was one of the major uh, driving factors in using the cast metal. Uh, plaquettes became popular around the turn of the century. Uh, you can think of it as providing a canvas rather than just a round circular uh, metallic uh, coin-like uh, structure to uh, produce your metals. We have Frederick Vernon's uh, Baths of Evian uh, shown here. Uh, also, again, in keeping with the art at the moment, uh, with uh, the, um, the painting and such and sculpture, uh, suddenly these became canvases 
uh, it was like the Impressionists, there was low relief, there were fine details, use of landscapes, uh, industrial settings were used. Uh, you didn't have to be an, a, a prominent individual, you didn't have to be royalty, you could be a workman, you could be a farmer, and these uh, various kind of day-to-day uh, -day functions were shown on metals. Uh, we have here the Charpentier's metal showing actually for the uh, Jean Vier machine, uh, which interestingly has reduced images on the reverse, which is something that you could do using the modern technology. And, uh, and conventional metal devices up until that time where you have raised rims and beaded borders and flat fields and stuff, were done away with, you know, suddenly there were no borders and, uh, and a lot of these other devices fields were, had more uh, texture to them or images and what have you. And to the right actually is the, the well-known uh, St. Gordon's cast medal <clears throat> that was issued for the Washington uh, inaugural centennial and a uh, very large format. And again, doing away with the typical medallic uh, devices. So uh, and now these were all innovations in France. So how did it get over here? Well, a, a lot of Americans seeing what was going on in France went to France to learn these techniques to study uh, under these uh, French uh, sculptor engravers. And uh, they included from early on, uh, Olin Levy Warner and Augusta St. Gordon, two very prominent American sculptors who studied with uh, uh, French sculptor Francois Joffre at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts. A lot of people studied at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts. Uh, Henry Chapeau, who was actually sculptor and medalist and uh, taught at the Academy Julian and other place where a number of Americans study, uh, including uh, John Flanagan, Herman McDeal, who was hidden a little bit in the upper right-hand corner, uh, Bela Lyon Pratt in the lower right. Uh, we see Victor de Breno, who traveled to Paris in 1898 to study with Oscar Roti, uh, and uh, several Americans actually set up uh, studios in Paris at the time, including St. Gordon's, Fred uh, McMahonies, and Janet Scudder. So there was this cross-fertilization of Americans then going to France, and then bringing these techniques back here. So this is now allowing the development of the art metal in America. All right. And now th there was also this concept of an art metal society, societies set up to promote the uh, issuance of metals they would take and they would engage artists, sculptors, engravers to produce things for the, uh, the benefit of their subscribers. Uh, there was the Art Union League, which uh, went on for uh, quite a number of years. And for a portion of that period, they produced metals, which I, I believe, David, you could get as an alternative. They also offered you a print, but if you if you declined the print, you could get a metal in place of the print. So, you know, and uh, there was actually they were quite active in the 1880s. They had as many as 20,000 subscribers. So clearly, this was a driving force in uh, England at the time. And we see here the, the one of the medals for William Chambers, uh, architect. Uh, in America, we, we kind of tried the same thing. Unfortunately, it wasn't quite as successful. Uh, there was the American Art Union, which only went on for, we see here, about a dozen years. Uh, there was a little flurry of activity in the late 1840s. They produced three medals to honor three American artists. Uh, the reverse dies was done by uh, Charles Cushing Wright, who was probably one of our finest uh, engravers at the time. We see here with the red background, the medal done for uh, Gilbert Stewart. Uh, the American Numismatic Society, which started way back in 1858, after really relatively few years, decided to get into the uh, medal making business. And their first medal was one to honor the memory of Lincoln. Uh, shown here to the right, uh, and they continue to produce medals, uh, but I guess we would characterize them more as portrait medals honoring uh, members of the society, uh, commemorative medals uh, to commemorate for a variety of events, including the Treaty of Versailles and uh, various anniversaries of the society. Um, a few reached the level of art medals, but most of them were not art medals per se, but they were certainly society medals. Two organizations actually more 
because there were also similar societies in uh, in Austria, Hungary, in Germany. Uh, there was the probably the first and the most prestigious was the La Société des Amis de la Médaille Française, uh, which uh, was started in 1899, ran for approximately 20 years, and in that limited time, sponsored medals that they issued 63 medals by leading French medalists and actually encouraged younger artists who maybe weren't as well known to produce medals. Actually, the lower medal in here was the medal that was issued at the start of the society by Alexandre Charpentier uh, in uh, 1899. And as I say, they sponsored a number more. There was also a similar Dutch-Belgian society uh, that functioned roughly during the same period. They issued 35 medals. And as I say, there was a German society, there were an Austrian society. So this whole idea of societies that would take and have subscription members uh, for the purpose of encouraging artists to produce medals for their members was certainly uh, very much established at that time. So from there, we move on to the first of American Art Metal Society, which is the Circle of Friends. And uh, I'll let David talk about this since uh, he was he's kind of wrote the book literally on this topic. So you can discuss some of this. Well, the Circle of Friends of the Medallion that we note here on the screen was the first more or less successful American effort in this direction, inspired from abroad, but uh, the father of it was a, of all things, a kind of a cultural journalist in the form of Charles D. K., who went around founding major, as they became, major art societies, uh, institutions to promote various branches of the arts. And D. K. had this thought that we would do a group to be called the Circle of Friends of the Medallion, he picked the word circle to avoid society or association and explained that it was going to be like a, a boulder dropped in the water with outgoing waves that would spread to the further, further shore and perpetuate the concepts of the value of art and the medallion. We don't know too very much about this outfit. When I first began researching it, I had the idea that it might have been an early effort of what later was known as the Medallic Art Company. And in correspondence with them, I was told they never heard of it, knew nothing about it, and what was it to me? Well, of course, as it turns out, this circle of friends was an autonomous body, started out with a medal for the um, uh, anniversary of the uh, steamboat, and then the themes dealing with the great industrial and architectural expansion of New York City and on and on. And in that period, they tried some very innovative ideas that strike us today as a bit peculiar. A figure in diaphanous Grecian robes reclining on the cliffs opposite the Palisades holding a glowing light bulb, which seemed like a very great idea to bring in the modern world which today would be considered almost grotesque. Well, the circle attracted, we know, more than 500 members by 1912, major figures in the arts, in industry, in high finance, ecclesiastical leaders, the Episcopal and Catholic Archbishops of New York. And among them was a young fellow named George Dupont Pratt, whose name will appear 30 years later in a similar capacity. They brought in a number of artists known to them as effective medallic sculptors and invited them to pick their own subject and run with it to produce a medal on their own thoughts. A characteristic of the medals was that each one was housed in a small duodecimo book, hardcover tan, easily damaged by moisture and mishandling. Uh, that would contain several pages of text believed to be written by Charles D. K. on the general theme of whatever the medal was. The medal itself was housed in a very thick cardboard page on the theory, as D. K. put it, that most people known to him at that time 
would have a hard time finding a medal to exhibit or show to somebody if they needed it. Where did I put that? Well, it was on your library shelf, slipped into the page of a bound book, finding it was very easy. The books themselves have a certain scenic appeal as they do today, if you can find them. The other great splash of the Circle of Friends was its role in the founding of what became Medallic Art Company that went on to be the major American producer of fine art medals down into the 1990s, who had a checkered career over the years and uh, lost control of the Circle of Friends to a firm in Philadelphia, Joseph K. Davison Sons, who were more commercial, industrial metal makers than they were artistic. But in any event, all the metals produced were very high quality and involved in wide, worldwide variation of themes that were picked upon that uh, today are only remembered because this was done in metallic form. Some of these artists are now quite forgotten. Uh, John Flanagan, who later got, uh, got a hold of the 25 cent piece design, did this wonderful medal for the celebration of Hudson and Fulton. That was a city of New York outburst to celebrate the invention of the steamboat and of the, uh, before that time, the discovery of the Hudson River by the late Henry Hudson. As we see here, very neatly done conjoined portraits with the gal with the light bulb on the reverse looking toward the skyline of New York, which somehow doesn't seem quite as grotesque as you might first expect. There are artists involved here that we've never heard of since. John Mulberry Clark did a particularly innovative historical theme on St. Brendan the Navigator, a figure hovering on the edges of mythological in pre-medieval Ireland, who was believed to have sailed to the New World in a hide-covered coracle and to have explored islands in the great sea that sound very much like the West Indies. And unfortunately, the way the book is written, a lot of very vivid and confusing imagery that led some folks to believe it was all just imaginary nonsense. And yet, as Charles Decay wrote, there was more stuff in writing about the findings imputed to St. Brendan than there was of the young Columbus who came along centuries later and became the de facto uh, revealer of the new world. I believe John Mowbray Clark had come to us from Jamaica and was quite an international figure, mm -hmm. now quite forgotten as half has a way of happening. Mm -hmm. John Severinus Conway was another obscure artist, although in his day he was quite well known, a native of Dayton, Ohio, who got plaudits for this remarkable medal dedicated to Charles Dickens, mm -hmm. a blithe spirit who was shown on the obverse in his glory days with the small beard and the contemplative expression. And the two figures on the reverse are taken from uh, the... Um, the Christmas, Christmas Carol, Carol. Mm -hmm. uh, Bob Cratchit and his crippled son peering out at you without any visible eyes, which always kind of got my attention. But the play placement of the two hats on those figures got enormous applause among artists of that time. Although today they're a trifle haunting. Conway faded away, died in 1925. Mm -hmm. The Dickens medal, when it can be found, is quite popular. Among the more international or what's the proper term for it, poly subject plaquettes produced by the circle was this portrait object of Abdul Baha, the Persian leader of a new international religious institution called Baha'i generally just pronounced Baha'i, which is still very active today, started out in Persia, as Iran was then called, by an individual who claimed to be a divinely induced prophet. 
he paid for that with his life because the Ayatollahs of that day were not a whole lot more uh, pleasant to deal with than we have today. But his third successor, Abdul Baha, a name which translates as servant of glory, was able to get out of Iran, get away from the Turkish Empire next door, which had housed him for a spell as a quasi prisoner, and ended up in the United States to popularize this new religion, which today has rather a substantial um, base of operations out in Willamette, Illinois. The exoticism of some of these designs really appealed to people. Mm -hmm. uh, the part, the Sculptor here was spoken of by Charles D. K. as some kind of a modern marvel, mm -hmm. although he's virtually unknown. The late Lewis Potter, whose career was comparatively brief, lived to do this plaquette of Abdul Baha and then promptly died. So among Baha'i people, this particular item is in great demand. Mm -hmm. It's the height of exotic. Mm -hmm. Now, among the themes that were less specific and more general, there was a, on the face of it, a supremely knowledgeable Scandinavian American sculptor from uh, San Francisco named Sigurd Neandros, who grew up in a stranded bark on the beach of uh, San Francisco, which his father had rebuilt into a house and never quite got the salt water out of his veins. So he designed this really haunting metal called simply Ocean with the implacable stern face of a great god of the sea staring toward the viewer with um, seaweeds around his two sides. Then at the back, the symbolic uh, vortex of life in which he hailed the concept of ocean as the beginning of life and activity. A wonderful metal, one of the only ones of the, of the circle of friends that has varieties of coloration, mm -hmm. the artificial patination, which later became a major concern with the, the next generation of uh, metal clubs. This one is very hard to locate. Neandros lived here in New York for quite a while and was a worker at the Museum of Natural History, which now can't seem to remember having had him. One day in 1915, the seemingly well-established and going concern of the circle of friends vanishes, literally poof, gone. Those who paid any mind to the history of the American art metal have always been at a loss to speculate, to theorize what happened to this seemingly successful institution. Mm -hmm. All sorts of things have been suggested. The war was on, although the United States was not yet in it. But Charles Decay was almost fanatically pro-French and took the paper writing that went with this particular medal for Joan of Arc, giving her history as the gal who attempted as a divinely inspired warrior to free France from the English invaders centuries before. And yet in the writing of the, the book that went with, imperceptibly, uh, the English enemy of that day suddenly merged into the German enemy of today. And there followed quite a lot of spirited propaganda for the Allied cause, which the United States had not yet decided to support. And the wholehearted enthusiasm that he showed may have alienated a number of influential members. But immediately after the Joan of Arc's servant of the Lord, appeared, the circle of friends disappeared. Mm -hmm. And by the time I got to be a collector 70 years later, nobody had ever heard of it, including the Medallic Art Company, which had made at least two of the medals. Uh, they sank out of sight and they are quite scarce, although they're obtainable. The trick is to obtain them with intact books, which is even harder to do. Mm -hmm. The books are a lot more inclined to decay and ruin than solid bronze is. Mm -hmm. So good hunting with it. If you can put a set of these together, you've done a major achievement. Right, and I guess we'll move on to the next uh, incarnation, you know, after the circle of friends, which would be the Society of Metalists, you know, had a much longer 
lifespan, uh, much more successful. And this is just a little montage of most of the metals. So uh, quite, uh, quite a, a collection of variety here. Um, so again, uh, we see uh, the names, well, George Pratt, who we saw as one of the subscribers to the Circle of Friends, was probably one of the driving forces behind uh, the, creating the Society of Metallists. Um, the um, uh, MAKO, the Metallic Art Company, which was a division of Deitch Company when uh, the Circle of Friends was uh, first created, there were the Wild Brothers who had run it, and then basically it was then uh, transferred ownership to Clyde Curly Trees, and he was also uh, in, uh, involved with the creation of the society. Uh, it was started in 19. 29, it was a nonprofit society that may be one of the problems with the circle of friends. The dues initially were at that time, of course, $8, which entitled you to two bronze medals a year and, uh, you know, a bunch of other literature. And uh, they said they were going to wait until they had a thousand members to uh, start production. And uh, there was a notice in the January 1929, the Mismatist said the designs would cover an extensive range of interests, such as natural history, sport, conservation, forestry, aviation, architecture, and similar subjects. And in actuality, they did manage to touch on probably, I think all of these in one way or another, and then some. Um, the selection process, they had a committee over the years of uh, five prominent medalists, and you see some of the names here who we're very much familiar with, who would take and review submissions. Some would be drawings, some would be actual uh, plasters, and uh, they would uh, give suggestions. Sometimes they would uh, go through it and recommend certain changes. Sometimes they would just outright reject certain items, and on occasion they would actually accept something. And to the right, we see uh, two sets of plasters. The upper one was done by Herbert Kammerer. This was turned down. And the lower one was by uh, the Croatian-American uh, engraver Ivan Mestrovic. Uh, this one, I believe, received universal claim. They uh, suggested that uh, this, uh, I think, Paul Manship, that they should immediately make this medal. And then, and in fact, it was then made. So this was the process. And... Um, the medals, just to give you some idea, uh, they were issued in these stamp cardboard boxes uh, for most of the run of the medals. Uh, the late medals, which were oddly shaped and larger, were in uh, the presentation cases. There was uh, literature, which was included, some fairly extensive. The medals themselves were struck uh, basically in... Uh, in copper, bronze, uh, up until 1975, there was, uh, they had canvassed the members to see if they were interested in restriking metals in silver. Uh, they wanted to originally produce them in a smaller size. Members said they would be interested, but at the same size that they were originally produced. And then they were going to take and uh, produce 700 of each issue in silver. Uh, of course, when the Hunt brothers started to corner the silver market and the price of silver skyrocketed, that pretty much put an end to the reissue of these metals in silver. Uh, I believe a few maybe were done initially, but most uh, were these reissues uh, that were done in the late 1970s. And uh, uh, some other features of the medals, there were a few that had gold or silver plating, uh, several of them are listed here. To the right, we have the Fiat Vita medal, uh, which was a silver plate. This was by Anthony de Francisi. Uh, also, Ceres Blessing with gold plate. Um, they also, uh, unlike the uh, Circle of Friends, a number of them can be found with a variety of uh, patinas. Uh, here we have... Uh, John Flanagan's 1934 Aphrodite medal, where you can see a very wide range of patinas. We have this golden tan, we have this green uh, this type of uh, patina, and this hematite red to the, to the right. Uh, there's, I think, more variety with the earlier medals. In this one particular medal, we see I've, I've found examples of at least six different patinas for this one medal. Also, uh, uh, there are uh, edge markings, marking them as Society of Metals medals, as well as uh, the Mako markings. These were all struck by Mako. Um, 
depending on where Mako was at the time. Some have the location listed as, you know, the late ones, Sioux Falls or New York or Danbury, Connecticut. Some of them just list Mako. Uh, so you can somewhat uh, determine the time when these were struck based on the edge markings, although sometimes they would use an older edge marking for a newer metal and a couple of the metals lack the edge marking entirely. Uh, but an entire list, if you're interested, is in David's book. I'll put in another plug for David's book that has images of all the various edge markings. And uh, in the final years, uh, there was some question during the 50s, 60s, and 70s because of the change in, uh, I guess, art, popular art at the time. The metals were more traditional and figurative. And of course, then thing, the art was becoming more abstract. And uh, that was at odds with some of the images on the metals. Uh, so over the years, though, uh, eventually the society kind of wound down in the sense that the administrative activities of the society were transferred to MAKO. So the society became somewhat a division of MAKO rather than being an independent society. Uh, in the late 1970s, you could actually take and uh, purchase back issues. MAKO gradually 20 issues per year gradually phased out the reissues. Uh, in the last years, uh, Joseph H. Noble who was of the Museum of the City of New York, also was involved with Brook Green Gardens, which we'll mention, became the managing director. And with that, actually some of the medals, the final medals in the series have a little bit of uh, novelty. They're unusual in terms of shape and design and subject matter. So he actually injected maybe a little bit of, of uh, more life into the series, even though it was winding down. Uh, 1991, Mako was sold to Tri-State Mint, relocated to Sioux Falls. Unfortunately, a lot of the uh, technical expertise did not relocate to Sioux Falls, so there was a delay in producing some of the metals. And the series ended uh, with uh, Jerry Menes Gould's Last Supper in uh, 1995. And I guess with that, I, we should show some of the metals. Okay. So here we have Laura Garden Fraser's issue number one, which was actually kind of a reboot. Uh, these, these designs had been sitting around, I guess, in her studio, waiting for some purpose to be used. And uh, well, this was the purpose as a society, Melis number one. I think she was saying that she was looking for subject matter that would just appeal to like the average person. And I guess, you know, hunting and game and game birds and stuff would be something that she felt would be, would have this kind of general appeal. It's hunting and endangered species together on one metal. Right, right. And it, it's interesting, it has the point that one of her uh, better medals is uh, she made an award for the Irish Setter Society, which has a very similar appearing dog on it. So I think uh, animal uh, the images on uh, medals throughout her career was one of her fortes, and of course she exploits it here. Uh, here we have uh, an interesting medal. This was in, remember, 1930. This was Paul Manship, a very renowned fact. I uh, put his Prometheus, and it probably is his most well-known work in Rockefeller Center to the lower left. Um, this medal actually stirred up some controversy because it had, uh, you know, this hail to Dionysus, which was kind of tongue in cheek, really. But, uh, you know, talking about the pleasures of the grape and wine and such. Uh, in a, an age which still uh, saw prohibition. Um, and I think that you said that, that there was actually mentioned this in the New York Times, that there was a whole dissertation about this medal. You know, so in any case, um, here's another example of uh, differences in patinas. <clears throat> Again, this was issue number two, an early medal. So here we have the tan typical tan metal, but here's the so-called hematite red metal, which I show below just to show the, the contrast, because, you know, some people will collect these with the variations in patinas since they are rather striking. Uh, Herman McNeil, who's known for, of course, the Standing Liberty Quarter and some other the beautiful uh, Art Nouveau medals earlier in the century. Uh, he spent time on the Hopi Reservation and it produced some, uh, I think, uh, bar reliefs 
uh, of um, Hopi of Native American images. So he came up with this image. He had seen the Hopi uh, famous snake dance, the prayer for rain, and he has his, uh, his uh, images of it here. Uh, interesting showing the snake dances. Also, he's got the stylized rain clouds in the back, utilizing these arrows depicting rain and lightning, and I guess kind of uh, an artistic uh, liberty uh, in terms of the snake images. And then the reverse shows the uh, Native American runners returning the snakes to their native habitat in the desert, you know, is trying to rid themselves of the snake as quickly as possible. But this one actually was a slightly ovoid uh, metal. Uh, and in later years, uh, they would uh, utilize uh, other shapes, but most of the early metals were done in a traditional round uh, format. Uh, Frederick McManus, who was known for some of his massive sculptures, uh, did a few medals, uh, but this is probably the most striking, I would say, of the best known, which is his Lindbergh medal, uh, which interestingly contrasts with the uh, U.S. Mint's, uh, the uh, Congressional Medal that was done by Laura Fraser, uh, in that this one, the, the imagery on the reverse especially is very dramatic. It shows the lone eagle uh, flying through, you know, storms and wind and, uh, and it's kind of uh, defying death. You know, all of these images are shown on the reverse. And this forward facing portrait of uh, Lindbergh, I think is very striking compared to the rather staid portrait on the Congressional Medal. You know, very, not easy to do a facing portrait, but in this case, I think it, he really did a splendid job. You know, and this is relatively late in his career. Okay, and uh, why don't you comment on this? Because this was one of the early ones that you said drew you to the series. This is one that got to me back in 1956. I was then somewhat younger <laughs> and I was paying my first visit to the American Numismatic Society Museum up on 155th and Broadway. And there in the gallery was a metal exhibit that apparently was assembled in the late 1930s and had not been changed or modified since, which I thought was fascinating. And in among them was this remarkable medal. I was about to begin a college career in biology. And I saw that cicada on the back with the Latin for fame and thought that was a remarkable symbolism that Genoine had it figured out that real lasting glory is like a little infant you know, sincere and spotless. And fame in the worldly sense is generally just brainless self-advertising noise as, as he called it, this obstreperous and insignificant insect. And if anybody that we're talking to today lives in New Jersey, they've had a bumper crop of cicadas this year that can be heard for miles. They have a very short life, but a wonderfully noisy one. And apparently he modeled this from life because it's a completely exact likeness of these large insects that are, I think are unique to the United States and uh, little known until they come bursting out of the ground every 17 years and start raising hell. Uh, okay, well, this is, I, I think, you know, in a sense self-explanatory. I mean, this is a, just a wonderful depiction of Pretty much, you know, the well-known, uh, you know, in peace, uh, sons bury their fathers and in war, fathers bury their sons by uh, Chester Beach, who actually was uh, quite prolific in terms of producing commemorative uh, coinage in the United States. I think he did the Hawaiian Cook and the uh, Hudson and uh, several others. Uh, but here, I think the imagery is very powerful. You know, you have these, the nudes, a very prominent musculature, of course, uh, on the obverse and reverse, uh, very, very striking. And I guess pre-signed in terms of the dating, this is 1937. So this would have been prior to even the European entry into World War II, but uh, obviously very, very pertinent uh, considering what was coming up over the subsequent years. I could make a note here Chester Beach had a home in Brewster, New York, which is about 10 miles from where I'm seated. And upon his death in 1956, 
the outbuilding that was a studio, which had enormously high ceilings to allow him to make statuary and design, was simply padlocked and left to sit until about five years ago, where one of his descendants announced they were about to liquidate the property and expected to sell this huge artistic heritage that was immersed in this little building. It had been out there since the 50s with no climate control, no air conditioning, no electricity. And yet everything in it was almost pristine. No rats, mice, or raccoons, and that sort. So the numismatic component, I was able to pick up with a truck that we had and haul down to the city for auction. The statuary went north to Kingston, New York, to a art uh, auction house, which simply blew it away with great speed, if not grace and whatever. And they had a 12 inch diameter pair of galvanos of this metal mounted on mahogany that even in that huge size were just simply overwhelming. The theory behind it was extremely poignant and literally true. So that, that was sold at uh, the stacks at uh, auction for a substantial amount and is now presumably the pride and joy of somebody's collection. But the funny thing was that Beach had died in 1956 and the collection didn't see the light of day till the mid 1990s. Mm -hmm. So is the way that sometimes happens. All righty. And uh, I guess this was a neighbor of Beaches up in uh, Rockland at Amateurs. Uh, and just uh, depictions of uh, two images from uh, Aesop's fables, uh, fairly well known, but probably the best known is the dog and the shadow, less known as the kite, the hawk and the dove. Uh, and um, this one was one of the silver plated metals, but uh, you know, just this, uh, this, these allegorical images. And uh, as we move forward, all right, so Walter Hancock, again, uh, 1940. Uh, at this point, you know, we weren't in the war, but Europe was, and he has these images representing the rebuilding after a devastation destruction, both man on the upverse and nature on the reverse, see these sprouting oak uh, uh, plants uh, next to this uh, decaying tr uh, trunk. Um, very, very prominent sculptor, and I think, you know, very, very dramatic uh, imagery. Uh, again, uh, uh, Maroney Young, who was actually, I think, grandson of uh, Brigham Young, who uh, studied both uh, here in the United States and uh, Europe and was fascinated with construction. And uh, among other things, so he has this medal showing, you know, the steel construction riggers on the obverse and riveters on the reverse. You know, I guess uh, typical of uh, interest at the time with, uh, you know, the uh, Art Deco and uh, focus on workers and uh, these types of uh, images, this type of imagery. Now, this is interesting, Berthold Neville, uh, who came up with this medal. Interesting, because uh, seeing that this came out in 1945, I thought that this was <clears throat> done post Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Actually, this was made several months before. So it, it, it predates the, uh, the use of uh, nuclear weapons by several months. But here's this image on the reverse showing the, you know, the classic mushroom cloud with, of course, the uh, remains you know, this, of individuals below. And on the contrast now with the other showing the shoulders assisting you know, a wounded uh, soldier offering a drink. But um, very, very dramatic uh, imagery and probably one of the first probably to deal with this concept of nuclear war. Yeah, Nebel was involved in a lot of uh, artistry showing that actually on the right, on the left, I should say, uh, one of the sculptures he did for the Hispanic Society up in Audubon Terrace, not far from, of course, from the uh, original home of the ANS. Sydney War, very prominent sculptor. This is an interesting medal with Nameless and Worthy Deeds, uh, which uh, has uh, interesting imagery, which is done in incus, uh, which uh, gives it a, a very distinct feeling. And uh, these uh, 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 
statements come, I think, was it Sir Thomas Brooke, I believe, was the uh, British, the Elizabethan author who had written the, the words of which this medal was based on. You know, to be nameless and worthy deeds exceeds an infamous history, interesting to having just, you know, just, just after World War II, where, of course, there were several individuals who had infamous histories. So just an interesting medal. Now, this is interesting in terms of, well, I think everyone's familiar with uh, Adolf Weinman and, you know, the Mercury Dime and the uh, Walking Liberty Half. Uh, but um, they had been attempting to cajole him into making a medal for decades. And uh, finally, uh, Clyde Trees uh, managed to convince him to produce a medal. And he came out with this rather striking medal showing his his kind of conception of Genesis on the obverse and what he describes as the web of destiny on the reverse, destiny being guided by the hand of Eros, which I guess in many instances will determine destiny in, in a lot of circumstances. But this was one of the, the uh, you know, final works, uh, Weinman, who for years said, well, you should take and hire, you know, younger sculptors. I'm too old to do this. And yet he came out with this marvelous sculpture. Oh, here's the Ivan Mesrovic piece that we had seen as places of before, which is interesting because now this is in very low relief compared to a lot of the other things which we saw in high relief. Uh, I believe the legends, at least on the other, uh, which were suggested by the panel of five who were reviewing his, uh, his, his uh, plasters, but again, striking, but in a, in a, a little, different fashion in this kind of massive below relief uh, type of imagery. Uh, interesting, there were several medals that depict Native American images, but there was only one Native American who created a medal. And uh, this is Alan House, a very well known uh, sculpture of, of massive sculptors. And here he's uh, uh, Chiricahua uh, Apache. And he has these images of a uh, Apache buffalo hunt and Apache uh, dance on the reverse using, you know, native images that he was familiar with. But as I said, uh, he was the only Native American to actually create uh, Native American imagery on uh, medals. Now, here's uh, one of my favorites. This is uh, Adolf Wyman's son, Robert Wyman, who uh, kind of broke the balance in terms of making medals here in several regards, very high relief. Of course, the shape is novel and the reverse uses this combination of incused and raised uh, design. So it comes up with this very, very dramatic, probably one of our favorite medals. I think you'll agree, <laughs> David, Dishonored to Socrates. So they're really uh, very, very, very striking, uh, very distinct medal in the series. Uh, we return here. This is Albert Weinberg's, uh, you know, Pandora one and two. And it's interesting because, you know, we're familiar with the legend of Pandora's box. So here we're kind of opening up almost like a cardboard box, as it were, on the upverse and reverse. And the upverse has imagery showing the uh, devastation of man. I guess the upverse and reverse would be man as victim and man as perpetrator of destruction. Of course, on the upverse, we have supposed to represent uh, pestilence and famine and all that. We've got, you know, these uh, insects and serpents and snails and what have you with these kind of these transitional faces going from a relative calm to, you know, I guess, uh, horror. And the reverse, needless to say, is this uh, superimposition of this uh, skull over the cl classic mushroom cloud. So, you know, again, dealing with two aspects of uh, the release of uh, evil, you know, one, as again, uh, man is victim and one man uh, holding the open ultimate weapon of destruction. Uh, John Svensson, who actually spent time, I think, uh, in uh, Alaska and uh, was very familiar with the natives and culture and native art, who came up with this really lovely Chilcat Clinket uh, Indian medal showing an inverse uh, clinket uh, with the traditional headdress and reverse showing a totem and masks and such. Uh, but again, uh, an Indian medal, not by Native American, but utilizing Native American imagery. Donald DeLue, who was like the, I guess, the dean of sculptors at this point, 
He had done an earlier medal dealing with creation, but uh, this one is very striking. And at this point, he was 88 years old, quite advanced, and yet very, very striking, this very high relief, difficult to produce metal, unusual shape, uh, required, I think, 10 strikings to bring out the relief in this case, but the so-called breaking the bond, or the, uh, bursting the bonds, I should say. And, uh, you know, again, for, it's one of his valedictory pieces, but very striking and, and amazing for somebody at that advanced age. Uh, now, there are some medals that we have cut through. And it's interesting that there are two of them that were consecutive. This was uh, Richard McDermott Miller, who was uh, a sculptor. Actually, I learned he taught locally at Queens College for a number of years, but he has this escape and capture. He focused on figurative imagery, mainly women actually, showed to the left is one of his sculptures at the Brooklyn Gardens. And here we have escape and capture where he very cleverly uses the imagery, which is similar on both sides, but not exactly the same. There are slight variations, but it works even with the cut throughs. And the idea is like who's being, who's escaping and who's actually being captured in this imagery between a man and a woman, but very clever use of the space. Another cut through, this is Marika Smoji, um, Hungarian American uh, sculptor. And this, uh, you know, all is, is vanity type of image, vanitas. You're here, you have a woman looking in a mirror, which is, you know, is where you can kind of look through to the back. And interestingly, on the other side of the mirror, who do we have here? But the devil who's seated with images of, you know, skull representing death. So, uh, you know, all is vanity. It's very, very cleverly done metal. And here we have Robert Wyman. Now he'd done the Socrates, you know, very serious medal. So when he was asked to do it again, uh, years later, he said, well, he wanted to do something that was totally different, you know, so something that's kind of whimsical and fun. And he came out with this medal, which kind of begs the question, well, when is the medal not a medal? When is it a sculpture rather than a medal? Because this is a, a kind of a freestanding medal. It's got this image of a cat and mouse, you know, with a cat peering around this piece of Swiss cheese with the mouse hiding in one of the holes. So it's, it's really very cleverly done. But again, is it sculpture? Is it a medal? Well, the, that's the question we ask more and more of nowadays. Uh, another interesting use of uh, an unusual shape, this is Patricia Barani, who also did some uh, US mint items, snow and sand. She wanted to show work animals that uh, were useful to man. So she narrowed it down to sled dogs and camels, but she manages to use this pyramidal shape to have these sled dogs kind of coming into the viewer's field towards the front. And the camels who were kind of pyramidal with the several on top, down to the four legs of the camel on the bottom. So again, very, very interesting shape, clever use of the space. Uh, Keiichi Uru, who uses these traditional kabuki images on this metal to demonstrate a man and a woman. And again, very striking imagery. You know, there are images of, uh, of the samurai and artists and uh, uh, dancers and such in the lower field. You see Mount Fuji both on the upverse and the reverse. But again, uh, very interesting use, you know, this uh, square shape and uh, imagery, which is certainly, you know, different than what we've seen using traditional Japanese imagery. So very strong. One of the things that he had accomplished here is that the Society of Medalists up to this time had limited itself to American citizens one had to be an American to submit art. And by now, partly because the number of active medalists was greatly reduced by the passage of time, they began to reach out to artists around the world mm -hmm. to make contributions. Notably, our friend Uryu here, who uh, died soon after, but produced this remarkably faithful example of Japanese art that was quite a major hit with American collectors when they found it in this form. Ah, all right, and also a favorite. This is Eugene Dow, who's still quite active. And this is his so-called fire and ice metal where they utilize a very clever use of materials. It's copper, which is silver plated uh, to complement the side that reflects ice. And of course, the red copper side reflects the image uh, representing fire. and. Uh, you know, the, the, the Eugene himself commented that the 
uh, ice side look, it looks so icy that you fear that you know your fingers are going to stick to to the metal because of the of the icy quality to it. But uh, again, novel shape, but a very clever use of material to demonstrate you know the differences between these two images. Okay, then we come to Don Everhart, who worked for the Franklin Mint, did uh, God knows how many things for the, the Franklin Mint, and then moved on to the U.S. Mint, where he's been responsible for creating or engraving other artists' images. Uh, in this case, uh, this was his uh, second item. He'd done a dolphin dance prize, which is probably one of his better known pieces, Dinosaur, which is on this irregular shape. And as he said, the nice thing about males is that you can show time on a metal because you have an inverse and reverse. And he certainly shows us here, you have the living uh, Tyrannosaurus on the obverse and then the skeleton, the fossil on the reverse. And he was actually, they revisited this a few years later. He came up with a, sex, a set of six uh, dinosaur fossil metals, uh, which was unusual in terms of doing it so soon after he had produced this, but that was in the, in the final days, the death throes of the society. Uh, Karen Wirth, who uh, had a long uh, career. Uh, she had done an earlier medal, but I think this one was more striking, the Adam and Eve image here, imagery, uh, very much Art Deco. You can see all the kind of the geometrics uh, and the obverse, this, uh, this very strong, it's, it says, I think, in the literature, cherub. Well, this is <laughs> it's certainly withholding the sword and the wings. So that's one of the strongest cherubs I've seen. And then the angular bodies of Adam and Eve and this kind of winged uh, serpent on the bottom. And this reverse, which uh, has this angel spearing, literally spearing this poor soul who's obviously descending into the depths of hell. So, you know, very striking imagery. Uh, but um, as I said, uh, I'm not quite sure what, what the, where the reverse is supposed to represent and compare to the obverse. If this is some other soul, if this is poor Adam, or, or uh, but I think he just got... Uh, thrown out of the Garden of Eden. I don't think he actually was thrown into hell. Maybe this is supposed to represent Mephistopheles or some other individual. You know, one of the characteristics of the last mm -hmm. metals of mm -hmm. the society was an experimentation with sizes and shapes. Like this particular mm -hmm. metal is like a hundred and something millimeters. Right, 102 millimeters, yeah. Vastly larger than mm -hmm. the tradition. But it was done successfully just as the society was starting to sink into oblivion. Mm -hmm. And at, before the very end, they produced some of the most imaginative work, mm -hmm. both in design and in size and in material. A metallic art company that was the founder of all this failed in 1991, collapsed and died. Its properties were seized by its bank. The building, the collections, the sculpture they had and all that which has been dismissed around the world since. And the group up in Sioux Falls, whose only medallic work up to this point had been silver rounds for semi-literate uh, precious metal buyers, were still capable of doing this kind of remarkable quality work in the time that remained. But it was a kind of unlikely outcome. And those of us who had belonged to the society up to this point never found out about these medals. They must have just jumped the mailing list when they acquired it from the defunct, defunct Medallic Art Company and uh, mailed these things to God knows whom. And as a result, they were very poorly distributed and very badly uh, little known to people who ordinarily was, were collecting this kind of thing. And when I was working on the book on the subject, getting hard information as to what existed and how many there were of what existed was a great deal of labor because the folks up in Sioux Falls were not particularly conversational with any kind of data whatsoever. And uh, we had to just go out blind, first of all, find out what existed that we knew and photograph it with what we could do. And the hope that if anything else turned up later, we could do another edition. As it worked out, we did catch up with all of them, but it was the oddest kind of a struggle. This was material done yesterday. We had full data and stuff done in the 1930s and 40s, but the one was done yesterday morning with the toughest things to get information about that was reliable. And if you can find these medals today, they should be rather 
significantly priced compared to really old metals who were much more distributed, mm -hmm. much more widely known. So, right in one of the later metals, it was this uh, Amanula Hardizad. You know, the, the interesting, as you were saying, it's topical considering what's going on at the time, but this old capital bazaar, which kind of harkens back to a lot of the plaquettes from the early 1900s. It reminds me of the imagery on a lot of the French metals of that period, but uh, has this, um, you know, nice overview, obviously, of this, uh, this image in Kabul, which obviously has relevance considering what's going on, like I said, in the news. Um, and uh, I think that was the, actually, I should just mention, this was the only uniface metal in the series, you know, and again, a large size uh, metal. The artist and, is a man of mature years who was mm -hmm. in exile in the United States. Mm -hmm. His cousin was President uh, Karzai that we installed in Afghanistan. And the government there, the new government had requested Brother Hyderzad to lead an international campaign to raise funds to reconstruct the great Buddha statues at Bamiyan that had been blown to pieces by the Taliban. Uh, perhaps wisely, he decided to do this from Staten Island, New York, and never went back to Afghanistan. And if I'm any judge of what's going on in the world, he never will. But he did produce this marvelous plaquette that captures the spirit of that ancient city. You can almost smell the, the dust, you know, and blowing around. But as we've said, it's the only uniface metal in the whole series and quite a desirable item. And of course, the final metal, which, you know, I guess traditional imagery done by uh, actually uh, Native Americans, both Native American and Hispanic uh, heritage, uh, Jerry Jimenez Gould, uh, The Last Supper with obviously these uh, various images of life priced on the reverse. Um, this, uh, I think this particular one done in silver. So as, as David was saying, you know, the, the mintages, the, the, the final series of metals, not, not really known. And uh, there are rare examples of these metals being done in silver. But again, uh, numbers, it's not really clear, you know, they'll pop up maybe one or two for a particular series. Okay, there were also several special issues that were produced over the years, usually marking the anniversary of the society. Um, there was a reboot of uh, John Flanken's Mark Train medal. Uh, there's a 40th anniversary, a couple of fifth anniversary medals, and one done by Marshal Jovin uh, for the bicentennial, which um, he also produced one of the regular series medals, but I actually prefer his bicentennial medal. I think it's less cluttered and uh, it, it's a kind of whimsical type of medal, this so-called Yankee Doodle medal where he utilizes the tricorn hat on the reverse and then utilizes the same shape on the obverse to show this image of Yankee Doodle uh, with the, the, the dog and the, and the rooster you know, on the bottom. So uh, the, the, the neat metal kind of uh, to supplement the regular series. We'll just mention very briefly the NYU Hall of Fame. It's not exactly society, but some of the medals do approach the level of art medals, although they were done, they're really portrait medals by and large, uh, reproducing the busts of uh, the notable Americans who were inducted into the NYU Hall of Fame. And uh, the Hall of Fame is, uh, in the, the, is now part of Bronx Community College in uh, the Bronx. Uh, from 1900, 1976, there were 98 individuals who were inducted. They were elected by a board of electors, prominent individuals who would uh, vote on them. And it was started, the series of medals was actually started by the Dr. Ralph Sockman of NYU in 1962. And um, they had, uh, again, an art committee with uh, you know prominent medalists. Again, we recognize the names, Donald DeLue, Stanley Martineau, Mar Michael Lance, and Paul uh, Genuine. And uh, they were struck also by Mako. 
in three sizes, uh, 76 millimeter bronze and 44.5 millimeter bronze and silver medals. Of the 98 uh, individuals uh, who were actually inducted into Hall of Fame, 94 of them were represented on medals. So virtually all except for the final inductees uh, in the last uh, years uh, that uh, they were still being added were included. And um, these, a few of these medals are shown to the right. Uh, also showing the box that these uh, came in, this uh, purple and white box with uh, literature. And uh, these are a few images you see uh, by artists, uh, Stanley Martin, Paul Field, and uh, Agap Agapov. Uh, uh, just a few more medals. So they were aware, uh, you know, these are silvers. Uh, again, you know, more inductees shown on medals. And again, there were names we recognized, Paul Genowine, Granville Carter, Evangelist uh, Rudakis, uh, and, uh, you know, various individuals here, certainly George Washington, Horace Mann, Daniel Boone, and social reformer Lillian Wald. And uh, there are more, just, uh, just to give you a taste of these. Now, we just want to spend a moment just to mention, because there are ongoing series of society medals, there's the Brook Green Gardens, which was started actually by uh, sculptor Anna Hyatt Huntington and her husband Archer Huntington of uh, A&S fame. In 1931, they bought this uh, land in uh, South Carolina so she could take and recuperate from tuberculosis in a warmer climate. And it was, became set up as a botanic gardens, wildlife preserve and sculpture garden, which was open to the public in 1937. And uh, the medals program uh, was started in 1973 by Joseph Veitch Noble, who we remember as the last uh, executive director of the Society of Medalists. And in order to uh, be eligible to get a medal, you had to be a contributing member to, of the gardens. So for $250, you had a garden membership and you'd get a medal. And that's the way it's been over the years. So it makes it a, a rather exclusive medal, although they are usually struck in the order of about a thousand medals. So they're not extraordinarily rare in terms of numbers, but they're hard to come by because of the fact that the distribution was originally limited to members. And the medals were created by uh, contributing sculptors. So people who have sculptures displayed at the gardens are likely to have made medals sometimes representing their own sculptures. The topics were usually three, either local history, local flora and fauna, or topics dealing with the production of art in particular sculpture. So this is the first in the series uh, in 1973 by Paul Genowine showing the Huntingtons appropriately on the obverse. And the reverse is the image of the so-called fighting stallions, which was a sculpture at the entrance to the gardens done by uh, Anna Hyatt Huntington. Uh, just a medal depicting uh, sculpture. This is uh, Richard McDermott Miller. We'd seen his escape and capture medal, his society of medalists. This is his medal where he's shown working on his sculpture at the gardens called Wind on the Water. We see the sculpture to the left and his depiction on the medal to the right and showing him actually examining his own sculpture. So again, the medal is showing uh, images of uh, sculpture and art. Here's a flora and fauna medal. This is Carter Jones, who's still active in New York, the Whackamore River Otters, which is really a, a, a very, I, I, Delightful medals, one of the better, I think, uh, animal medals showing these uh, otters on the obverse and this uh, above on the ground, and then the one swimming below ground uh, on the, uh, above, I should say, underwater on the reverse. Here's a historical medal. This is Simon Kogan, Russian American uh, sculptor, his Garden of Liberty showing the Battle of uh, Sullivan Island in 1776 on the obverse. And the reverse showing, uh, it's a little bit hidden, but the, uh, uh, the Huntingtons are on the obverse looking at plans for the garden. And then there are uh, soldiers, revolutionary soldiers looking at plans below. So a historical medal. And uh, the most recent medal, as far as I know in the series, which was uh, Heidi Waysweet's Black Crowned Night Heron. Um, and uh, this is from 2017. This actually won, I think, the Medal of the Year Award from AMSA. But, uh, you know, wonderful. Heidi does wonderful images of animals. And here is her image 
two of the night heron, you know, one on the obverse from looking at from the reverse and one showing it on a branch on the uh, reverse. Uh, just a wonderful, wonderful imagery. Uh, and just to toot our own horns, uh, the David, who uh, I may be too modest, but is responsible for the founding in, the, I think, the 1998, the uh, Portland, Oregon a and &A, these uh, metal collectors of America. So over the years, the metal collectors, aside from studying and collecting metals, we decided, well, the metal collectors organization should be responsible for making metals. And uh, with uh, actually at that time, editor of our journal, John Adams was responsible for funding the production of our first medal in 2012 by uh, Alex Shagan. And we show that medal to the right. And he created annual medals through 2018. And I show uh, one of his uh, iterations uh, kind of reflecting on the uh, Indian peace medal there. And then uh, more recent medals were done by Eugene Dalp and Heidi Wastley. And an added attraction, these are low mintage medals. You know, we've had you know, no more than 50 medals in bronze and less than 30 medals in silver. And just to close, I just wanted to show Eugene Dalp's beautiful uh, depiction of Native American here called the Native Sun. I you know, showed me this image, which if you look closely, he's wearing an Indian peace medal, a little bit of which you can see just towards the bottom of the obverse. And of course, this image of peering out over the plains in a kind of his shrinking world uh, at, the, at the time. And the final one, uh, by we're fortunate to get Heidi to the Brave and Steals the Sun, which also uses Native American imagery and the legend of the raven uh, stealing from a box the sun and releasing it into the sky for mankind. So the raven, in a sense, is kind of a collector. So there's the parallels with the male collectors of America. And with that, I just want to acknowledge, of course, David's books. If you want more information, I highly, highly recommend that you get the American Art Medals, which covers the, the Circle of Friends and the Society of Medalists, and also his more recent publication on the Hall of Fame Medals. Uh, there's also Barbara Baxter's book, which was published earlier by the uh, ANS on the Bose Arts Mill America. It has a lot of interesting information on the development of these series as we've done. I also want to is thank uh, Alexander Kraft, his metal medallic art collector the website. I highly recommend he has images of most of the medals from these series, many of which I thank him for allowing us to use in this presentation. And with that, I guess we're ready for any questions. Whoopsie. Oh. <clears throat> Okay, you're, 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 hey, you're, you're uh, on thanks, it. Thanks, David and David, for a great presentation. Does anyone have any uh, questions? You can post it in the Q&A uh, function. I've got a question, guys. I'm getting ready to go to sure. Rosemont. Uh, oh, yeah. Does the Metal Collectors of America or any other metal organization, what's going on in Chicago? Well, I believe that the metal collectors will have a major meeting. I don't know the exact date with a speaker right the, kind of good stuff. They right generally do a very spirited turnout and a lot of uh, updating yeah. what's going on in the world. Right. I, I can actually be a little more specific. I believe we have a meeting on uh, Thursday, August 12th at 2 p.m. So we're definitely going to have uh, a meeting there. Uh, I'm trying to recall now who our guest speaker is. It's going to be good. I don't remember off the top of my head, but, but we, we do have a guest speaker who will be there. And uh, we will also have a club table in the, uh, in the club, uh, you know, the, the table section. We're sharing it with uh, TAMS and uh, Civil War Token Society. So we will have material there, you know, to represent the club. So if anybody wants to chat about MCA, we wander over to the club area. Great. Um, I'm going to take one from someone else here, uh, Renato, then I'll get to your question. <clears throat> um, uh, here's a question, guys. Uh, can you tell me anything about the AE2 Thomas Edison medals uh, each year starting in 1909? 
I'm sorry, we, we, which, which Thomas Edison medal? I, I might be butchering this. Uh, it's A E I I or two. I'm sorry, I'm butchering this. Um, Thomas Edison medals awarded each year starting in 1909. Does that ring a bell? Oh, that I'm not sure. An award medal for Thomas. I, I was thinking because there's a Hall of Fame Thomas Edison medal. Right. But I, right. Um, oh, I, I'm not, I'm not I medal. A E E I. Does that ring a bell? It may be is it some American engineering institute. Yeah, major something? award yeah, medal by right. some scientific right. okay. or industrial yeah. group. Mm. There's never been any kind of cataloging of that kind of thing. I don't know why. The medals do turn up once in a while, but they're like one shot per year. And as a result, the base of stuff to collect is quite limited. Mm -hmm. Do not know that one well. Okay, well, let's go on here. Uh, oh, I, I don't, I don't, I guess I don't consider us a society if we're, we're a, an association more, but uh, we have a member that's asking about um, ANA convention medals. Uh, that is something that should be a lively field and really is not. Several years ago, when Neil Harris was the editor of the Numismatist, he had begun a series of articles methodically describing all medals issued by the ANA since about 1890-something, and then got just to some recent point in the 60s or so, and the whole thing lapsed. There is a tremendous uh, resource there of material bearing the name of the ANA. The <laughs> early ones are generally quite elusive because they were issued for an organization that was lucky to have 100 members. But in modern times, like uh, I always get the big metal that comes out. They do a large size diameter one that is sold to people who are registering for the show, mm. which other members don't know even exist. They're quite striking. It'll be the design of the one that's made to wear with the little ribbon, which mm. are generally about the size of a silver dollar. And these bigger ones are by comparison, huge, mm. but issued in tiny numbers and are a mystery because nobody seems to really go after them with the, enthusiasm that their beauty would tend to dictate. I think right. if they ever updated the listing that Harris had begun and all this information was suddenly available, much like we've done here with the Society of Medalists, once they have a guide to follow, interest in any one of these series could get really explode. Mm -hmm. It takes more publishing to get to that point. Right now, and then the series actually, it's interesting because uh, I know, I think that half the series that was in the numismatist includes for variations, which, uh, which, you know, unless you really study the series, I mean, they made what they called the ladies award medals, which were like oh, yeah. very small, like 19 millimeter medal lit during like the, I guess the late seventies and eighties, a few issues were made in gold over the years some were issued as as badges some were issued as as pinbacks you know so it's a it's a very extensive series and and the numbers are are generally relatively small i mean you know in more recent years they have gone up but even like some of the large bronzes the probably mintages of under 200 if that many and certainly the earlier ones, of course, the, the classic is the 1915 San Francisco medal, where I think maybe they had 15 attendees. So, you know, it's an extraordinarily rare medal. So that's it. So there, there are lots of, you know, for somebody who studies the series, there are a lot of interesting things to, to collect in that series. I think this year for our, uh, for our Chicago convention, the run is 100 of each product. And I think... Um, in previous years, it's been up to 150, but I believe this year's 100. Mm -hmm. And there's actually uh, Neil, both Neil Harris and Barbara Gregory, every 10 years, like I think the last one was put out in 2010, published an article in the Numismatist that covered the previous 10 years of medals. Mm -hmm. um, and I've used that as a resource. I really should get that online so all of our member members can just look at it because there is interest. In, in past years. Um, so if you do use our online magazine, you can find that. I think it would be 2010, 2000, 1990, going back, detailing what we've had the, pre the previous 10 years. All right. 
Uh, someone's asking, uh, asking how you can get your books, uh, David Alexander. My, well, now, the American Art Medals book was published by the American Numismatic Society in 2011. A hardcover, fairly large size volume, and had a kind of exciting um, jacket price of $115 a copy, which impressed me at least. And very recently, there was a rumor went down the road, and I traveled to find the root of this rumor, that a major remainder book distributor, if you all remember years ago, there was an outfit called Marlboro Books that would handle the remainders of every kind of published volume that had ceased to be a brisk seller and were heavily on the hands of the publisher. And things that were published for like 50 bucks would suddenly be available for 59 cents. This is long ago when I was uh, in college. Well, recently there was word that American Art Medals was available. I'm trying to think of the name of the outfit. I'd never heard of them before. One of the remainder distributors for basically $15 a copy. Bearing in mind the original price was 157. This is kind of a come down, but I can't remember the name of the outfit. It had some Anglo name like Essex or one of those based in New England somewhere. You probably find it on the internet. I don't know how many copies they had to distribute. I managed to acquire a few. Uh, the book on the Hall of Fame for Great Americans is available from Amazon Books for a very low figure, some 20 something dollars. You check it with them. Uh, that, of course, is a paperback and as a result, less hefty initial price. But I do not know quite how Amazon handles things. I bought a few of them for gifts and things myself. But one of the difficulties is that with these mainline major distributors. The numismatic world is kind of out of their purview. They just don't know about us. Although whoever it was that was selling the American Art Metal book must have learned about it. And I hope it encouraged them to continue their interest. We don't know quite what happened there. And these things just have a way of happening. The old joke about Marlboro books years ago, they used to hand out, mail out on newsprint, folded tiny type listings of books available. And the old joke was somebody's finishing some treasured volume and his little nephew who hates him makes the famous statement, may you sell out at Marlboro Books for 59 cents, <laughs> which is only to start a family fight that wouldn't be too easy to settle. I cannot for the life of me remember the outfit that has the Hall of Fame. I should know that. But again, I'm not sure how many they had and whether they were all blown away by now. You could attempt to uh, contact the ANS, but I'm not at all sure they have any remainders. I would guess from the logic of it, they disposed of all the ones they had. I'm sure that's Somebody not that exactly. That they did uh, recently check out the uh, American Art Metal book by Dave, uh, David Alexander from uh, right here at the ANA's library. We're starting to uh, check books out again and uh, deliver stuff to our members. So that's another resource for you. Again. All right, everyone. Well, David, David, thanks for a great presentation again. Very informative. This is, going to be, this is going to be online on money.org. We have a, a backlog of our e-learning presentations as well as on our YouTube channel where all of our e-learning presentations are available since we started doing this uh, last year. So once again, thank you, David. David, I'd also like to once again thank the Gray Sheet for sponsoring our e-learning program. Um, please join us for future presentations. Also, please join us for the World's Fair of Money coming up in a couple of weeks. Uh, COVID it's been a while since, uh, uh, since we've had a great coin show. So um, I hope to see you all there. And again, thanks for joining us for the e-learning academy. Have a good day.